Hello there, everybody. Welcome back to Leading Our Own Way. Today's guest, Lindsay Byrne. Oh, I met Lindsay Byrne from Coventry in the UK uh, a few months ago. She's absolutely fascinated. I feel like I manifested her into my life because I've been studying and reading a lot about the brain in the last few years. And Lindsay does just that. She's also led very similar journeys to myself in taking interest in neuroscience-based leadership concepts, having her own leadership business before going self-employed and training in, in, in helping people with their minds and their brains. We discuss some very important issues today of connection, relationships, trauma, um, bullying in childhood, also things around food and sleep. Absolutely fascinating. Um, we go deep into her journey of how she became into brain health. Um, we talk about her book that is now releasing. It's all the information is in the show notes. Um, it's going to appear on, on my shelf very, very, very soon as well. Um, by the time this is published, actually, it will be sitting on my shelf. Unfortunately, it's not quite here yet. Anyway, we have a very, very interesting conversation. I learn a lot. She verifies some of the things that I've learned and, and taught myself over the last few years as well. Uh, and everything else I've taken on board in this in this particular area. So welcome to Lindsay's episode this week. Um, it's fascinating. I hope you can take a lot from it. I know you will. And uh, maybe it'll help us, you know, self-reflect on how we think about our brains and our minds and what we can do to live a long, healthy life as well. Um, yeah. So we'll be right back for part one and keep coming back every single night this week to join us for the rest of Lindsay's episode. Enjoy. Welcome to Leading Our Own Way. I'm your host, Andrew White, and this is the podcast that unveils captivating narratives of resilience and personal triumph. This podcast is for anyone seeking inspiration and insights on overcoming life's challenges. Follow and subscribe, and then we can lead together forever. Hello, Lindsay Byrne. Welcome to Leading Our Own Way. How are you today? I'm really well, thank you, Andrew. Thank you for having me. Oh, no. Thank you for joining me. Um, probably have to go back to our pre-chat. We, yeah. we spoke maybe five, six weeks ago for the very yeah. first time. Yeah. Um, and you are one of my first brain experts. As you can see, I've got quite a few books where I'm very passionate about the brain. Uh, in yeah. the last two years, I've taken a lot of interest into it. And um, I've, I think I've, I feel like I've manifested you somehow <laughs> um, because I have you here on the podcast <laughs> um Lindsay tell everybody uh, what you do for a living uh, so I am the cognitive health coach I help people with brain health with memory preventing dementia so quite a lot of my clients come to me because they've got parents who've lived with dementia and they're perhaps starting to notice some changes and they want to make sure they don't go down that road. But I also help people who um, even have a, di a, a diagnosis of dementia um, to make some improvements and uh, yeah. to slow the whole thing, to press pause and maybe even get some improvements if you catch it early enough. Yeah, wow. And what brought, what brought this passion to you then, Lindsay? been interested in nutrition and health and I've always tried to be as healthy as I can be um, but there's a lot of um, rubbish in the media <laughs> uh, so it's hard sometimes to know what is healthy um, but what actually really set me on this journey um, before the pandemic I noticed my mum's memory getting a bit worse she was quite good at covering it up um, and I don't think that's necessarily a conscious thing um, I think it's just a self-preservation thing. You know, you, you guess at answers to questions um, rather than admit you don't know or you don't remember. Mm. Um, and then in the pandemic, um, we were, well, just before the pandemic, we were trying to move mum and dad into a retirement village. And just the house sale and everything that was going on, I don't know if the stress of that made her worse or whether it just showed up that she couldn't hide things, she couldn't... Um, you know, hide the fact that she didn't really know what was going on because there was so much change. Um, but it really became apparent that she was much worse. I had a bit of an issue at the same time, actually. Um, my training and executive coaching and team coaching business took a bit of a dive in the pandemic. So I had no income and nothing much to do. Um, and I think the stress of that and the stress of what my mum and dad were going through and worrying about moving them, etc., um, and her uh, 
what turned out to be diagnosed later on as Alzheimer's. Um, I think the stress and worry of that affected me quite badly. I um, ended up um, experiencing all sorts of menopause symptoms, um, including some brain fog. Um, and that really hit around about that time. So I think stress did have a big part to play in that. Um, and then in the pandemic, I met somebody who told me that he'd almost completely reversed his symptoms of Alzheimer's. I met him on a diet forum, will you believe? Mm. And he was doing a very specific diet to um, to reverse his symptoms. Um, and I just got so excited. He sent me lots of books and references and clinical trials and videos to watch. And I just got so excited. And that's when I found the Bredesen Protocol. And I got my mum on the protocol as quickly as I could. And she started seeing improvements, like really quite significant improvements, not just wishful thinking on my part. You know, yeah. um, people, other people were noticing the improvements. Um, and, and that was it for me. I didn't have much going on. I didn't have much purpose in life. I was feeling really lost. And this just came to me as this is what I've got to do. People, I was really angry that this this protocol had been going on for years in the US and yeah. it seemed to me nobody in the UK knew about it. And so um, it really came to me, this was my new mission in life to let everybody in the UK know about the protocol um, and to um, help people. So um, I spent a good part of the pandemic um, retraining and um then, you know, in 2022, I, I set up my business after I'd fully qualified and um, started helping clients improve their brain health. And that is why it is such a big passion of mine. Um, the fact that I improved my own brain health despite menopause, I managed to really minimise my menopause symptoms. My mum is doing so much better. Um, and, you know, I, it just feels like it was meant to be. <laughs> Oh, that's amazing. That's beautiful. You know, I, I normally start the podcast off by asking how you, how do you think you're leading your own way or how are you leading your own way? Because mm. I, I just feel like you've already answered it. <laughs> so, uh, <laughs> right. and, I, and I've got a million, I feel like I've got a million questions because I've done a lot of reading around it over the last two years and mm. you've obviously taken it to the next level and, and gone and got all your qualifications. But outside of the story of why you built uh, the business and why you went into this direction on a daily basis then how do you think you're leading your own way how do you set yourself for su su success then what does your day look like when you're working with your clients you know i have learned so much from my functional medicine health coach training as well as the alzheimer's specialism the recode health coach training i've learned so much about um looking after yourself first because how can you give to others unless you're looking after yourself. Mm -hmm. And the fact that it's not just looking after yourself, diet and exercise wise, it's your entire lifestyle. It's your sense of meaning and purpose, which is very strong in me right now. I felt very lost before. Um, it's about your stress management and giving yourself time to relax and reflect. Um, and I try to bring that to all my clients as well. Um, and I definitely feel like I need to be practicing what I preach. I, I, I need to live that lifestyle myself and look after myself. Yeah. Otherwise, how can, I, how can I expect clients to turn their entire lifestyle around if I haven't tried it first, tested it out, found simple ways to fit it in, found ways to reframe it in my mind to make it easy um, so that I can give them um, those tips as well? So for anyone that needs those, let's say the, the viewers were your clients then, mm. what, uh, what, what sort of tips would you give them from your, from your perspective, what you maybe reflect on what you do then, what would you, what would you say to those people that would really need, if they were going through some of the things that you've encountered, brain fog, uh, yeah. struggling, not understanding purpose, their mm. meaning in life and things yeah. like that, what tips would you give them? Well, the very change. first thing is, um, the first thing that I do with a client is actually get them to do a self-assessment on all the areas of lifestyle. So they can say, I give them lots of definitions. I give them like a little bit of pre-work, a little bit of homework. And it's in a typical um, wheel of lifestyle format that um, a lot of coaches use. But I've adapted that to include all the areas of lifestyle that have an impact on your brain health. And I ask them to self-assess in all those areas so that they can decide what they want to work on first. Mm. 
because just because I did it in a certain order doesn't mean that's the right order for mm. my clients. You know, some clients want to hit it hard. Um, maybe they want to do the diet first and they just say, just tell me what to eat and I'll do it. <laughs> But yeah. lots of clients take a long time over some changes. Like diet is one of the biggest cornerstones of the yeah. whole protocol. Um, and for some people, it's really hard to change the way that they've been brought up, the associations they have with food, from memories from happier times, memories from with their family, celebrations or, or whatever it is. Mm. It can be quite hard to make those changes. So it's about really deciding for yourself to prioritise and work through, you know, have a think about all the different areas of your lifestyle. What area do you want to work on first? What, what motivates you? What do you feel like, yes, that might be easy to do or I might get the best bang for my buck if I, um, if I start there? So it's, it's going to be different and how you judge that is going to be different for everybody. Um, so, so that's the starting point, really. Um, and then whatever order you want to work on those things in, just take it one step at a time yeah. and, you know, just try and implement one thing at a time. Because if my clients were already noticing some changes, they might be either feeling a bit brain foggy or they might be getting fatigued. You know, if we make some small changes, those small changes will bring little improvements even if it's just to feel a little bit more motivated or to feel a little bit more focused and um, to be able to then take the next step and the next step. And then you get into this virtual cycle of just improving and improving and feeling the benefits that make you want to and be motivated to make the next changes. It's like you fall in love with those small changes, doesn't it? You know, yeah. I, I mean, I think we've, I mentioned this to my previous guest, one of my previous guests, we do New Year's resolutions, but they tend to be too big. So by week three and week four, they, they die out. Yeah. And um, I did go pretty hard, I must admit. But I started, but I fell in love with the change in how mm. I felt in my head. You know, I could have exercised till I was blue in the face. And I'm not saying it doesn't help. It does help. But I started making other small changes by getting up earlier in the morning, being in the sunlight early morning for a walk yeah. i I've, the viewers know that i do my cold ice baths every morning and i did those small small little changes every day and i slowly reduced sugar mm. and i started to feel better i started to feel more alive and i fell in love with being clear am i perfect no do i have days where i reflect and go i had loads of sugar last night because it was movie night I definitely feel it is. And now I look at it like alcohol as a hangover. I feel that difference, if that makes sense. You just said it all. It's obviously different for everybody. But how? what was your specific order? Where did you start in your change? And um, so I, I definitely started with diet. Um, I yep. had got in a bit of a mess in the early pandemic when I wasn't, um, you know, I was feeling without any purpose and I was feeling um, like I had no income. And, you know, I was feeling quite depressed and um, I was worrying a lot. Mm. Um, and I had been eating some rubbish and drinking a bit more than I should. So um, I definitely started with diet. Um, and that was actually how I found the whole protocol, <laughs> because I, I kind of pulled myself together and thought, right, this is it. I've got to make a change. I'm going to I'm going to work on my diet. And that's where I met the, the guy who told me about the Bredesen protocol. So I definitely yeah. started on diet first. Um, and then I'd say the purpose came to me because it was just a revelation to find the protocol and you know that gave me my purpose in life and then after that it was really about stress because of all this worry and stress I've been going through I really had to um, make a conscious effort to um, deal with my stress and it's not something that came easy to me um you know um I, I don't really enjoy meditating and that's a, a probably a terrible thing for a health coach to say. <laughs> um, I can relate to that. I, I, I don't, I don't feel like I enjoy it either. I'm glad yeah. you said that actually. Yeah. Because I know intellectually, I know that it's okay to have thoughts while you're trying to meditate and to just notice them and bring yourself back. But actually that's the part I find really hard. I have lots of thoughts. I'll go off and like think about what I need to do for work <laughs> or mm. make a list or, or whatever in my head. And then I think, oh, see, I've wandered off. I'll bring myself back 
to the meditation. But the point is, I feel like that actually stresses me out because I'm doing that again and again and I actually get stressed. So um, I did try meditating a lot and I know that the advice is keep it going for four to six weeks because you won't feel any changes before that because that's how long it takes for our brains to rewire. Um, but still, I had to find different ways. Um, so I ended up just focusing on breathing and just, you know, every now and again, take some time out and do some deep breathing. Um, and I took up reading again. I used to love to read. I used to I used to be a voracious reader. I would read all the time. Um, and um, my eyesight started getting a little bit worse and I need reading glasses. And it kind of put me off reading, um, mm. which is a bit of a rubbish excuse, really. But I decided, no, that's it. I'm going to start reading again. And I feel like when you're reading, well, for me at least, I am totally in the zone. I am in flow. My husband can talk to me and I don't even hear him. <laughs> so for me, that is the ultimate in being present. <laughs> Yeah. So I had to find my own ways around that. I'm not saying um, don't try meditating. I mean, do try it, but um, don't be discouraged if if it turns out it's not for you. Do give it a good crack of the whip. Give it the four to six weeks. Um, but if it's not for you, find another way. Find something else that really gets you into flow. Yeah. No, it's a very good, very good piece of advice that because I kind of align with you there. I, I, I don't. I don't believe I meditate. I probably do more breath work when I'm in the cold yeah. exposure. I'm not yeah. saying that's the safest option. <laughs> um, <laughs> and I actually listened to the Diary of the CEO Wim, Wim Hof's episode. And he was saying, don't do it in conditions where you need that control. And mm. I suppose maybe I do, because if I lose that control, I might go yeah. under. <laughs> um, no, I mean, I do do it. And I, I do it there because I feel, I feel like I'm killing two birds with one stone, yeah. if that makes sense. But the breathing yeah. allows me to focus on... Um, not avoiding, but getting through the traumatic experience of being in the five degree water in mm -hmm. the morning. Yeah. I, I don't look at it as traumatic anymore. I did once, <laughs> but yeah. you know, I'm calmer now when I get in. Yeah. Um, but this is about your journey and your purpose. Mm -hmm. Going back to the diet though, everyone might be going screaming now, right? Well, give me that oh, diet, yeah. please, Lindsay. Oh, yeah. <laughs> yeah. And um, I, correct me if I'm wrong. I don't know if it's, for me, diet, there's no, I know we can call them Mediterranean diets and mm. Mediterranean diet and the, the other diets that exist, mm. uh, low fat diet and all that. I believe that we should just go back to, um, and I'm guilty of it, but just whole foods, mm. plain and simple. Uh, you might, and this is why you're here to tell me otherwise, but go, go very simple, whole mm. foods, anything that grows from the ground or anything that eats from the growing ground. Yeah. Where does your... Where does yours, your opinion lie on that? Well, I totally agree with that. If you can't recognise the food, if it doesn't look like a bit of chicken anymore, if it doesn't look like the vegetable, you know, if it doesn't look like it just came out of the ground and got chopped up, then it's probably a bit too processed. Yeah. Definitely whole food is the way to go. I mean, I think, uh, I mean, there is a very specific diet with the Bredesen Protocol, um, which is the Keto Flex 12-3 diet. Right. It is very much based on whole food. Um, I'll just describe what I mean by keto and flex and 12-3, first of all. Yeah, because I know the go, keto what? was, yeah, because the keto, wasn't the ketogenic, is that how you say it, the ketogenic diet? Yeah. Is that how you say it? I don't feel like I'm saying it correctly. Um, that was invented about 110 years ago, I believe, yeah. something like that for people who were suffering with seizures. That's right, epilepsy, yes. Yes, I, knew, I thought it was yes. right. I thought that's what I read. And, <laughs> and you can go on it. I think something like if you do it for five years, um, that's when you can slowly come off it. But it was to reverse the um, the mechanisms in your head, in your brain, from what would trigger the seizures. And it yeah. seemed to be quite effective, didn't it? Yeah. And you know what? It's absolutely crazy that even today, People with epilepsy, they go, they get drug treatments, they try everything, and the last resort is, well, try a keto diet. Oh, <laughs> well, why just is tried it first. the first thing that we try? <laughs> you know, yeah. something that doesn't have any side effects other than healthy, good ones. <laughs> why, why isn't that the first thing we try? <laughs> yeah. We'll, we'll come back to that because that's very interesting, but talk to us about the, the diet then. Yeah. So, um, your uh, viewers will probably be familiar with the keto diet. 
um, but there are so many different versions of the keto diet out there. I mean, there, there are some really dirty keto diets um, like Atkins, where you're encouraged to eat way too much protein and loads of really saturated fats, heavy cream and lard and the like, and not very many vegetables. Um, I I don't know if that, that is still the Atkins diet. They might have changed their approach by now. I I only recognise that from more than 20 years ago. That's, that's where uh, that approach was. And um, so you can see that is not, I think everyone can agree that is not a healthy way of, of going about um, a diet. You might well lose weight, um, but uh, you, you can't sustain that in the long term. Yeah. So the Keto Flex diet, um, first of all, it's very much whole foods. Um, there is a big emphasis on as many uh, different coloured non-starchy veggies as you can. All I try to do is to have at least half of my plate, if not more, sometimes three quarters of my plate, be non-starchy, colourful veggies, lots of different colours. Um, and then just a normal amount of protein. There are there are lots of guides online if you want to work out from your weight and your height how much protein you need to be getting. There are, there are um, tools online that you can work that out. So just a normal amount of protein. Um, and then really ramping up the healthy fats. So your extra virgin olive oil, your um, nuts and seeds, your avocados, that kind of... Re and, and obviously, you know, oily fish. Oily fish, really good because it's full of that good omega-3s that are great for your brain as well. Absolutely. So the keto element. Flex is um, that you don't have to be in chronic ketosis. What we're trying to achieve is metabolic flexibility. So you talked about people with epilepsy trying the diet for five years and then being able to come off slowly. Actually, with my clients, um, I try to get them into full ketosis and try to stick to it for around six months. <laughs> so initially, for the first couple of weeks, just to really get into ketosis properly, um, to be really, really strict. And you might really restrict the amount of fruits you're having, no grains, no uh, no starchy carbs, and to be really strict so that you get into ketosis. By the way, I'm just going to break off for a second and just say that this is the natural way of being for human beings. Yeah. Now, if you think back to cave people, they would be eating loads and loads of fruit all summer. Mm -hmm. And uh, all that sugar would raise their insulin levels um, so that they would store loads of fat. But then as soon as autumn comes and there's no fruits, and no carbs, no sugar to be had, we would automatically go into ketosis and use our own fat stores and ketones as fuel for our body and our brains. So yeah. we were automatically metabolically flexible. We could get in and out of ketosis all the time and use different fuel sources, ketones and fat or sugar, for uh, fuel for the brain as and when. So yeah, what we're trying to get to is metabolic flexibility. So a couple of weeks of really strict keto. And then I encourage my clients to test their ketones. And you can do that numerous ways with um, urine test strips or a breath meter or a blood meter, depending on you know what you prefer and how accurate you want to be. But I like to get my clients, as soon as they've been quite strict for a couple of weeks and they're definitely in ketosis, start testing different foods. Because every one of my clients is different. Everyone can eat different things. I can eat a small apple and stay in ketosis. I can have a spoon of Manuka honey every day, which I did during the pandemic for my immune system, and stay in ketosis. Um, and different people will react differently to different foods. So I like to get my clients testing different foods to see see where their boundaries are, because I don't want anyone to feel restricted. I want their diets to be as broad as possible and interesting as possible. So that's the flex part. Right. And then the 12-3, I know I've been talking for ages, so I'll just do the 12-3 and then I'll no. take a little pause. And... No, it's fascinating. I'm yeah. learning. I love it. Um, great. Uh, yeah, the 12-3, basically, uh, we encourage people to fast for 12 hours as a minimum. Overnight, overnight, which is which is not that big a deal. So if no. you're eating at 7 p.m. at night, you can have your breakfast at 7 a.m. Lots of my clients push it further. Some of my clients know their genetic status. They know if they've got the the gene that uh, creates a risk for Alzheimer's, which is the APOE4 gene. If you've got the APOE4 gene, um, we try and get people to fast for at least 14 hours. 
But personally, it suits me to fast much longer than that. My first meal of the day is lunchtime. And then I Mine finish too. eating. Yeah, I finish eating by 7 p.m. So that's, that's a good long fast. Yeah. So 12 hours minimum, 14 if you do know your genetic status, or, or longer if it suits you, if it's okay with you. Um, I don't want anybody to starve it or feeling like they're starving or they can't, <laughs> they can't cope. Sure. Um, but you've got to, again, go back to the cave people. They didn't have three square meals a day. They didn't, they didn't wake up and eat straight away. They woke up and had to go foraging for it. So, mm-hmm. you know, they were able to fast for longer. Yeah. Join us tomorrow to hear more from today's incredible guests and learn valuable insights to help you lead your own way. Don't forget to subscribe. We'll see you then.